Tree almost 20 years ago as an undergraduate student at Ringling School of Art and Design. He was a guest lecturer there, and I was so impressed uh, with, his, with his lecture. It was the first time that an instructor had gotten inside of my head to look out. Um, all of my instructors up until that time had been telling me what I needed to know, what I needed to memorize, the books I needed to read. And Mr. Guthrie was the first time that that uh, brilliant mind had, had bothered to take time with me where I was with my work and help me see out. Um, he has been giving critiques this morning. He's giving critiques all day tomorrow and all day Wednesday. And I've heard very good things back that, that he is still doing that and helping students see. My experience with him was he was able to uh, pull the curtain back like the Wizard of Oz on the art world. The art world was a, was a big enigma, a big plastic shiny thing that was unobtainable and, and ununderstandable um, even in art school. And Derek was able to pull the curtain back. Um, the new art examiner is Derek and his late wife, Jane Adams, uh, co-founded. It started in Chicago. They actually uh, took out money to start the magazine out of a need to express art and art criticism that was not happening. All of the art criticism was coming out of New York City. And they felt so deeply that there needed to be another voice representing art that was happening in all the different regions around America that they started their own publication. Um, it started in Chicago. Jane Adams, Allen, and Derek Guthrie it started. It was uh, originally black and white. It became very popular. It then went to color. Um, they hired more writers around the country. And if you ask uh, what, was the, what was the premise of the magazine, what were they trying to do, they would say that they were trying to have each reason, each region take control of their own art criticism. That you can be responsible, you must be responsible for the art criticism in your area. You can't look towards New York City or another region to be your voice. You need to be your own voice. They eventually moved to Washington, D.C. Um, they were very concerned about the NEA and government and art. And this is the late 80s. Um, I see a lot of young faces in the audience, and you may not know the story, the turmoil that the visual arts went through in the late 80s. And Jesse Helms um, seriously attacked visual arts and artists. Um, and, it, and it peaked with a show uh, at the Corcoran Museum. There was a Maplethorpe show scheduled, and the Corcoran caved in to pressure that was brought by Jesse Helms' attacks on artists. They caved into that pressure, and they pulled the Maplethorpe show. The second time that I uh, met with Derek, we stayed in touch. We communicated and wrote letters. I met with him in Washington, D.C., in an evening when it was civil disobedience. I mean, we built a big stage. There was a projector. Uh, we waited till after dark, and we projected the banned images of Maplethorpe onto the outside of the Corcoran. And Derek Guthrie gave the keynote address to a, to a very large crowd there. We crossed paths again. I would hear about uh, Mr. Guthrie through, through different channels. If I would go to CAA or INSECA, people were very proud of the fact uh, if they had an article published or something written in the New Art Examiner, 
This was a radical magazine of its time. It, there was nothing else going on. Everything was art in America, um, flash art, these very glossy advertisement magazines, picture perfect magazines. And then there was the New Art Examiner that was asking hard, tough questions that nobody had the courage to ask. Um, the images that we're looking at now uh, was half a dozen of my old issues that I could dig out of my uh, bookshelf. There were dozens and dozens and dozens of issues. It's been about 10 years since this magazine was published. Um, when you take on the government, when you take on the National Endowments for the Arts, you're taking on some pretty serious foes. Uh, Derek and Jane got beat up pretty bad over it. Um, uh, Jane became ill. They moved back to England. Um, health insurance was one of the uh, factors. They sold the magazine. The new owners of the magazine began selling a lot of advertising. They wanted to take it in the same direction as Art in America and, and some of the other glossy magazines. And they killed it. Um, Jane passed away. Derek has been in Cornwall for the last 12 years. There has been a tremendous resurgence in interest in the new art examiner and in Derek Gussery. There's an upcoming book on Derek's tremendous influence on art critics, art critics in America today. Many of the current art critics were writers for the New Art Examiner. There is interest in making an anthology of the New Art Examiner magazines, reissuing them. If you look at these covers, these covers are 10, 12 years old. These are, these are valid issues today. It was ahead of its time. And there's a lot of writing and study being done on that right now. Fortunately, Mr. Guthrie is, is ready to, uh, to come back, come back to America, come back on his lecture tours, and we're, we're very lucky to have him with us. So without any further ado, I give you Derek Guthrie. Testing. Sitting in the wings, I look forward to great anticipation to hear what the speaker is going to say. Thank you very much, Valet, for your introduction. I find it a little overwhelming. And um, I'm going to start with a piece I found, a part of a piece that, that we published a number of years ago in the New Art Examiner, which I, I, I haven't seen any New Art Examiner, it's about 12 years, because I've been living remote and I do my own painting and look at cheese and I haven't been thinking about the art world or criticism. I should tell you now that I'm not really a critic. I'm, I'm an artist that found it was easier, or was allowed to make a living with words because the art faculty didn't feel comfortable to have me on the faculty, so I had to go out onto the street. Um, the words were, even after mental breakdown, Van Gogh, was remarkably lucid. This viewer's depression on leaving the museum was not caused by the self-portrait in the last gallery. Although mutilated by his own hand and obviously numbed by the cold, 
Van Gogh, the artist, triumphs over Van Gogh, the madman. In this soaringly honest picture, if the red and the green violet and the yellow brilliantly woven together in complementary counterpoint stand for the divergent emotions warring in the artist's soul, they also stand for his ability to transcend those emotions in the creation of majestic colour harmonies. No, it was not the Met's appalling commercialization of a profoundly serious exhibition. The shop, though which visitors must pass on their way out of the show, raises tastelessness to new heights. Cheap scarves blazoned with quotes from the master, picture puzzles of sunflowers, tawdry knickknacks are hawked with blatant sentimentalizing hard sell which makes a travesty of the Met's tax-exempt status. The New York Museum's efforts to milk the Van Gogh tragedy for all it is worth goes even further. In the hopes, no doubt, of whipping up public demand, the Met opened the exhibition to the press and the sundry elite a month before the actual public opening and weeks before the press were allowed in, in more than $430,004 tickets for Van Gogh and Arles went on sale at Ticketron, locations all over the country. Lured by this blockbuster debate, some 430,000 visitors will no doubt pay their money and obediently enter during the appointed half hour to mill along the with multitudes of their fellow art lovers. If they are lucky, they may catch the glimpse of a Van Gogh painting and joins over the heads and the shoulders of the other moving bodies in a snail pace stampede. How many people will be able to linger long enough to absorb the important lessons there to be learned about the dimensions of a human spirit? How many artists will be able to t return again and again to the exhibition so they can take full measure of Van Gogh's greatness as a goal for which to strive? How many artists will be able to return how many lost souls will be confronted by the intense humanity of those paintings and drawings? How many children will discover that for the first time what a line or a colour can mean to the expression of their innermost feelings? Are these things what an art museum is for? The circus which the Met had created around Van Gogh seems explicitly designed to elicit the most superficial response. It is said that Mark Rothko committed suicide in part because of his inability to control the circumstances which his paintings might be seen. If any nightmare could justify Rothko's fears, it was surely this one. This is doubly unfortunate because the show itself is such a sterling example in the way art historical scholarship can add to our understanding of an artist. Often heavily biographical exhibitions, and this is one of them, tend to place too much emphasis on supposed correspondence between works of art and the artist's emotional life. Van Gogh has been particularly victimized by this treatment. Museum docents love to pollute the minds of school children with such statements as you can tell from the wiggly lines of paint and the strong colors that Van Gogh was really upset when he painted this. <laughs> However, it is not the artistic breakthroughs nor the emotional breakdown that creates the drama of Van Gogh and Arles. That was written in um, 85. And as we're dealing with Van Gogh, who must be the cornerstone of the mythology of art for us, all of us in the 20th century, and the fact that the Metropolitan is the leading museum in the country, I think that was an indication of things to come. Unfortunately, 
it was. Before I go into the lecture, I'm going to say that defining art is a mugs game, not because art is mystical or mythic, but because the concept of art is so culturally varied at any given point in time. Quote from Margaret Burden, a philosopher of cognitive sciences. Our society today is dominated by mass media. <clears throat> to what extent our reality comes from the TV, to what extent we see the world through our own eyes, to what extent TV does our thinking for us, shape, present and discover the world for us is a matter not yet understood. The power of the media resides with the sound bites flashed together with fleeting shots of presidents or presidential candidates, film stars and other captives of the personality cult. The managers of political campaigns, media consultants, editors and photographers who produce magazines, the designers who produce an endless display of interiors, furniture and gardens have replaced many of the functions that we used to call the art of painting. Now television sells dreams. The other seller of dreams, the tourist industry, with the help of hoteliers, have turned the world into a dream landscape that at first glance will look like a Kincaid painting. Kincaid knows how to paint. He is competent. His paintings are well organized. He is an artist that works in the community. The community likes his art. He has cultural meaning. He is a successful and popular artist. His paintings look like they're made on an acid trip <laughs> or spiritual enlightenment, how could anyone find so many twinkling luminous drops of effervescent, highly dense, wondrous arrangements of colour and light intermingling and floating around unless one is underneath the rainbow? <laughs> There's no rainbow, no matter how much we dream well into the sky, but not on the earth, as Dorothy found out. Kincaid found his yellow brick road. So did Andy Warhol find his yellow brick road. His went through Madison Avenue and the Museum of Modern Art. Andy made art inspired by commercial art. Kincaid made commercial art inspired by art. The game of the art world today as, any, as the art world of yesterday is cultural control and control of cultural variance. Today the artist cannot sell his dreams as he used to as he no longer has the technology. In a review of the Salon in 1859 entitled The Modern Public, The Photography and photography, Charles Baudelaire writes, since photography gives us every guarantee of exactitude that we could desire, they really believe it, the mad fools. I feel so envious of Charles Baudelaire because political correctness did not limit critical language as it does now, and they had more freedom than we did. That photography and art are the same thing. For the moment, our squalid society, nobody took him to task for calling it a squalid society. Anyway, squalid society rushed, narciss narcissistic to a man, to gaze at trivial images on a scrap of metal. Madness and extraordinary fanaticism took possession of all the sun worshippers. Strange abominations took form by bringing together a group of male and female clans got up like butcher and laundry maids at a carnival, and by begging those heroes as to be so kind as to hold their chance grimaces for the time necessary for the performance, the oper operator flattened, flattered himself that he was reproducing tragic or elegant scenes from ancient history. 
Some democratic writer should have seen it seen here a cheap method of disseminating a loathing for history and painting among the people. That this committed the double sacrilege, insulting at once and at the same time the divine art of painting and the noble art of the painter, of the actor. He later concludes in this final paragraph could an honest observer to declare that the invention of photography and the great industrial madness of our times has no part in the deplorable result? Are we supposed that people whose eyes are growing used to considering the results of the material sciences, though they were the products of the beautiful, will not in the course of time have singularly diminished its facilities for judging and feeling what are amongst the most ethereal and immaterial aspects of creation. Bold words, they would not be tolerated today, either in form or content, and certainly not possible in the popular media. The mechanical eye, which now includes TV and movies, dissolved the world of appearances, has dissolved our perceptions of self, and has eroded our sense of self. Freud, Marx, Darwin, Einstein, science and technology have changed the world since 1857, brutalized time, and we have lost our connection to the natural world, even if we live in Tennessee. Baudelaire was just an art critic by observing humans responding to the novelty of the mechanical reproduction had very serious consequences for our visual culture. His disagreement with the new media was unfortunately profound as he realized that the photograph was the beginning of the end of art and that the mechanical reproduction would lead the public into a synthetic world of make-believe. I repeat his concluding paragraph. Are we to suppose that people whose eyes are growing used to considering the results of material sciences as though they were the products of the beautiful will not in the course of time singularly diminish its facilities of judging that are amongst the most ethereal and immaterial aspects of creation? Today the immaterial aspects of creation are taken care of by the avant-garde with the one exception of Andrew Wyatt, and he doesn't take care of them either. But now they are under the auspices and products of the museum, and that is the official culture. But it's a very long time since 1857, and we are not sure what truth or beauty is anymore, and also history. The closing down of history is near complete as demonstrated by the 2007 Oscar ceremony, Hollywood. The royals, Princess Di and Prince Charles, became in life the best soap opera that England could produce. The survival of the royal family is testimony to the English tradition of confusing life and art. Shakespeare started it all, and since the royal family has obliged by becoming a set of characters that play themselves with spectacular backup that outperform any show that Hollywood can put on. Di caught the public imagination. The English Rose, who converted herself into the girl next door and stood up to mother-in-law by telling her that she was not going to be bullied by her son and on and on and on to the road death in Paris, while still feeding conspiracy theory of a possible James Bond type of assassination. The Queen, trying to keep law and order in a messy domestic front, thought that Di should behave like a princess and shut up. She did not, she went to the media and she stuck it to Prince Charles and retaliated by matching his lover with one of her own, and so on and on to the road death in Paris. Along comes Helen Mirren. The fine actress plays the Queen's side of the story. The stiff upper lip becomes heroic and changed the nation's previous idea of the Queen as a mean-spirited mother 
in law to the nation's favorite grandmother. Baudelaire comments on clans dressing up to reenact history. Now we have television, we have permanent clans, all dressed up all the time, and we have no history, only soap opera, and that is what the public want. Our Oscar award by the Academy of Popular Culture and Banality has done its job. It has crowned banality with banality, and Helen Mirren says in a Hollywood crowning, I give you the queen. The great icons of our time, the Dalai Lama, the Pope, and the Queen are all semi-divine. As they are semi-divine, they can stand revisiting by the media. Gods don't get boring if their status is assured. Icons of history will survive as there is no history without icons. Baudelaire, with visionary anticipation, the sensibility of the populace will be reduced and the images of mechanical reproduction will replace art and eventually degenerate awareness. Whatever the art world may think or not think of a Kincaid painting, it is historical. It's the last whimper of landscape. It's a child's version of paradise. It is a Shangri-La of lost horizon and also Oz without the wizard. The kitschy vulgarity of the Oscar ceremony is no different than a King K painting. When it became quite clear that pop art could not compete with the original commercial art made in by the street and for the street, take pop art out of the museum and put it in the street and it will immediately become another ready-made and will be overpowered and lost by the dynamic of the real thing. If art aspires to be an icon, and I think that all art does, it needs a place of worship to reside in. And the failure of museums in recent years is that since abstract expressionism, pop, and Joseph Boyce have not been able to produce superstars, that they have found any art that will occupy the museum space with the appropriated gusto and expansiveness. The American Museum has established a tendency to respond and encourage large-scale art. Now, European museums have another tradition. It's a legacy of domestic space. There's much room for the non-heroic in the great houses of England and the palaces that have major collections and accumulators of art of the allied arts, furniture, interior decoration, the culture of connoisseurship is an established tradition and the idea of the carefully made and the carefully chosen are circumstances of a visual creativity that leave the smallest span both physically and culturally for the artist and craftsman to occupy. Domestic art, for example, watercolor, decorative furniture, interior design, all these things incorporated into Jane Austen's novels are missing. The American Museum does not have a fallback position from the commitment to the large and the overwhelming. I think resulting from a short history and a wide open landscape that has not had time to accumulate the layered meanings that any European landscape must have. Likewise, Manhattan. Yes, it is a colossus, a magnificent architectural manifestation of heroic materialism, but does not have the complexities and the change of a scale that the older European cities have. Manhattan is a chessboard, and each square is a tower, and it seems a little fixed. The culture of Manhattan is made in Wall Street. It is an investment that drives Manhattan. It lives, as all markets do, on the simple question of supply and demand. In spite of the art historians and the critics and the museums, there's not much more that Manhattan can put into art. The novelty of art is over. The avant-garde is over, and art has lost its political purpose. And it's my personal opinion that the NEA came to an end when the Berlin Wall fell because there was no longer any need to have avant-garde art to take on the Soviet-dominated communist world. 
The 50s and the 60s were defined by the State Department as much by covert money that was pumped into and expanding the traveling of American avant-garde art through European museums and the rest of the world. I saw it in New Delhi. The point that I'm driving to is the question of how art world resolves around the art and the artist, but understand the forces that define and shape the art world is not in the hands of the artists or even the critics. It is not a question of the aesthetic alone. How the different fashions of a new avant-garde come has been studied and understood. The ivory tower of indifference, as enjoyed by academics, is simply not appropriate. The leading wizard of the advertising and media is Charles Satchi. His wealth is mighty as his reach into the art world. He for years has played the market and has made and broken artists and has frequently cited along with Damien Hurst and Tracy Ehrman with putting Brit art on the international map. At present, he is prospecting the exploding art scene of Beijing, and I'll guarantee that in a few years, museums will be exhibiting Chinese art and will receive an orchestrated and critical offensive to explain the merits and the originalities of Chinese art since it has been liberated to find its place in the New York market of capitalism. Only last year, when talking with some curators, major museums in New York was told they felt much pressure from Western banks to exhibit Chinese art, which they thought to be awful. The defining of art, as I said in the beginning, is the mug's game. And it's particularly stupid if you don't have a large production team. And it goes on television. When that all happens, all cultural variants are taken care of and expectations are flattened. Sachi will succeed. His power rivals Rockefeller. It's years of legendary feat of media. Sachi's power of media was to take a dowdy Margaret Thatcher and made her into the living reincarnation of Elizabeth I and English history. For a moment was briefly reignited the Brits believed that for some brief moments the glory of the Tudor days had returned when they invaded the Maldivas Islands in Argentina. The world was introduced through strategic image building and the world met the Iron Lady who was respected by many, loved by few, and Ronald Reagan. Thereby, Charles Saatchi established himself as the Holbein of the modern media and the Wizard of Oz at the same time. And they say we live in an age of visual culture. The demoralized and wounded and still mesmerizing Colossus of Manhattan remained a monumental center as a cultural bourse where art was traded. It has reached a point of inflationary power never seen in the world before. But just as by the 80s it was evident that New York curators felt that graffiti and other trivia were significant art for the next 15 minutes, why should artists in Chicago, Sydney or Brussels take seriously? Why should anybody care about the porcelain inanities of Jeff Koons? I also pose that they posed issues that should be responded to. By demonstrating the bankruptcy of innovation, the 80s inevitably changed the old modern relation between form and feeling. Once the task of modernism, modernism had been radically new forms from which new feelings would naturally be born, but minimalism is the last moment of that kind, and the idea of formal innovation was played out in a welter of low novelty art. Thus, the serious artist needed to go into feeling, even at the risk of looking conservative. Museums would lose sight of this in the 80s on both sides of the Atlantic. They clung to their decaying fictions of the progressive with the same obstinacy that 50 years earlier to exclude modern art. Robert Hughes wrote those words. He's not an academic. He's a passionate art enthusiast and a great journalist. 
as culture it is possible that his Australian legacy gave him the confidence of plain speaking. Hughes is not bound by academic language, which does not mean that his analysis is not penetrating and sound. When Arthur Danto made his famous lecture series, The National Gallery of Art, the title of the lectures was The End of Art. A ripple went around the American art world. The title was provocative and the timing was right. The New York art world had lost its confidence in contemporary art, but now it was official. Danto was a professor of philosophy at Columbia University and a long-established art critic for the nation. And he provided the answer that there is no art anymore. It was reasonable not to feel confident about art. His words are soothing. He looked at philosophy for the explanation of the unease that he and many colleagues felt. He found the answer, which was that art as we understand it was defined by Hegel, and it, art had finally caught up with its own philosophy and in doing so reached its destiny and died. When Danto was reading The Last Rites and the other art guides were in mourning, the market was still in carnival mood. It was apparently Good Friday for the cognoscenti, but not for the traders. The market continued to pulsate, and the thirsty millions, as Danto calls them, crowded out the museums, and the consumption of art continues, and auction prices continue to rise season after season. Dante, Danto does not walk alone. A massive and excellent book, Art Since 1900, copiously illustrates the art movements of the 20th century and also the critical ideas that interfaced with the making of art. The authors of the book, Hal Foster, Rosalind Kress, Yves Alain Bois, and Benjamin Burkhold, are the royal family of criticism. They hold important academic posts, curate exhibitions, and have dominated critical discourse in New York for the last two decades. The final roundtable discussion in the book signs off with great pessimism. It seems that this generation of critics are joining the previous generation of critics of Donald Cusper, Hilton Kramer, Robert Hughes, who have all jumped off the New York art ship some years before. Art since 1900 ended with the final roundtable discussion, the predicament of art. It was a conclusion. Benjamin H. Buchholz, with the social historian's point of view, concluded with these words. For most participants in the contemporary art world, and that includes ourselves, I don't know why he's not sure on that, but anyway, he includes himself, have yet developed a systematic understanding of how the once integral element of the bourgeoisie public sphere, represented by the institution of the avant-garde as much by the institution of the museum, have irretrievably disappeared. It is now replaced by social and institutional formations for which we do not have concepts and terms, yet those modus operandi remain opaque and incomprehensible to most of us. We have even larger and ever more imposing museum buildings and institutions emerging around us, but their social function, once comparable to the sphere of public education or university, for example, have become completely diffuse. These new functions raise from which holds, if not the gold standard, at least the value warranties for investors and speculators in the art market. To those of congregational space, semi-public, in which rights are enacted, the promise to compensate for, if not to obliterate, the actual loss of our sense of a once-given desire and demand for political and social self-determination. Buchholz lays his disillusionment with more determination on the door of the museum than his colleagues. While all the critics have their pet peeves, the general, folk blame, the general focus blames the failure of the museum. Even the gentle Danto says the museum has disenfranch disenfranchised art, but the root cause is the end of Hegelian aesthetics. Hilton Kramer blames the liberals, Buchholz blames the bourgeoisie that have lost its progressive soul. I blame the fact that artists have lost their dignity. 
the most famous artist in America either throws paint around the place or minces around like a clown. Andy Warhol was a superb performing monkey, maybe the best performing monkey of all. I'm a little performing monkey, he's a big one. Always on the stage and so many golden eggs to his silk screen credit line. Postmodernist criticism followed Andy Warhol, he just cleared the way for it. Postmodernism has embraced the new media, picked up on the old of Duchamp that art could be made by designation. Postmodernism was a product of the French Academy. It gave new life to Cartesian thinking, which believes that the perception of the individual is the greater reality. The art system of galleries, museums and art departments are brought into the avant-garde of the 70s and the 80s. It was a compact world which more or less existed on the same circuit, funded by grand tax deductions, tenure and high-minded principles of speculation. The art world is a strange world of polar opposites, disinherited, not-for-profit academic academy and curators and high-powered insider trading of trustee collectors. While well, the museum accepted the idea that anything became art, it became magical. If anything crossed the doors, it turned into gold. All the artists had to do was sign his name on the toilet. The managers no longer had to pay craftsmen and they busied themselves with promotion. As promotion in politics is politics, promotion in art has become art. We now have actors who turn into presidents and presidents who turn into actors and we have artists who turn into actors, but actors do not turn into artists. The paintbrush and the studio belong to yesterday. New technologies are more efficient. And Baudelaire, the father of modern criticism, turned in his grave, as Clement Greenberg did, the father of American modernism. The gesture that Duchamp made in 1917 got a new lease of life by post-Warhol generation that could attach symbolic meaning to anything they desired as long as it was enclosed in a museum or gallery. Anything could be art. And this is good for self-delusion and provided the artist joins with a sense of urgency as it is possible that art may be terminal became a matter of concern. There's no business like show business and the show must go on. The spectacle of art took over. Performance and installation replaced the carefully made object, object and short intention span replaced connoisseurship. The new became a cliché and the avant-garde as a progressive ideology died. A new audience was born and an old audience passed on. It's hard knuckle under the champagne glass. I discovered the hard knuckle of the museum, Art World, in 1971. How are we doing for time, by the way? How long? We got time? How long? Okay. By a series of events that only Providence could have provided, my late wife Jane Adams Allen and I ended up, much to our surprise, as art critics of the Chicago Tribune under a joint byline. We were fired for no other reason than the museum pressure. And we also had an article lifted from the galleys of Art News a few days before going to press as a result of pressure from the Chicago galleries and museums. We faced the possibility of total elimination as we had been professionally assassinated. We had no future. We were blacklisted. We had to become our own publisher. We were lucky with a little help of some friends and defiance of the Museum of Contemporary Art. We banded together and we published a four page newsprint tabloid that had about as much gloss as a circular advertising remedies for unwanted hair. The new art examiner came into existence as part of our defiance, but also a wish to have a life involved in art. The art departments were afraid of us. We had no jobs. We were losers. 
And a few months after publishing the New Art Examiner, a book, which is a collector's item now, circulated through the membership of the Museum of Contemporary Art, privately published, which de described us as deluded, self-serving, unwashed hippie communists. The book, <laughs> the book was called Art and Defilement. Following in the tracks of McCarthy, we were demonized, and we, of course, we were the defilers of all that was good and beautiful. The young woman who wrote that within a few months was a volunteer for an alternative gallery, wrote the press as least, was given a catalogue to write by the museums. The first editorial of the New Art Examiner was a little breathless. We were without understanding of what we embarked upon. We were naively idealistic. We sought freedom from the dominance of the museum. We saw it art as belonging to everybody. We were not posturing this heroic. We just thought what we were doing was in the natural flow of mainstream. We thought that is what artists and writers did. It was an understanding that the post-war generation of 50s kids that we were held up to those beliefs because that was what the war was fought for. We thought that if we could make an art magazine that was open, that generated dialogue that was free from affiliation with no particular artistic credo and achieved some measure of quality that eventually would earn acceptance into the hierarchy of the art scene in Chicago. So with a sense of adventure and optimism, and pride, we published volume one, number one, and it was called Without Fear or Favor, a famous line from that great American writer, journalist H.L. Mencken. The New Art Examiner is a new kind of monthly public publication, a monthly tabloid that will cover, without fear or favor, visual arts in Chicago and the Midwest. Beside reviews of exhibitions, the standard fare of an art publication will include behind-the-scenes stories, the San Pianalo Biennale, news briefs, regular review of criticism, the mass media, coverage of alternative galleries and analysis of various aspects of the art world, and critical coverage of today's agencies of patronage. The museums and the arts council, both state and federal level, we hope to combine in one flexible instrument coverage that one occasionally finds in the glossy art magazines. The examiner is also meant to be a forum for the artists of Chicago and a vehicle for their communication. Why such a publication in Chicago? Coverage of visual arts in our city suffers from external neglect and internal indifference. The art publishing industry is in New York. Reviews of Chicago art events are few and far between the nationally distributed magazines. But far more devastating to the creative art scene here is the scarcity, than the scarcity of national reviews, is the tendency on the part of our mass media to report art news almost exclusively from an institutional point of view, and even worse, to equate art with entertainment. Arts and fun, with a heavy emphasis on the fun, is the password. We believe that art is serious that it has to do with ideas and values that is far more important to our society than our society is ready to admit. The artist is an undervalued man. One, on the one hand, he is the goose that lays the golden egg for a vast arts industry that rivals the stock market as a world institution. On the other hand, he's supposed a master Ulega man on an ascetic trip that has nothing to do with anything else. We say with a bow to Picasso, what do you think an artist is? An imbecile who only has eyes if he's a painter, or ears if he's a musician, or a liar at every level of his heart if he's a poet, or even a boxer, just his muscles? On the contrary, he at the same time, a political being constantly alive to heart-rending, fiery, or happy events in which he responds to in every way. How would it be possible to feel no interest in other people 
by virtue of ivory indifference to detach yourself from the work life they so conspicuously bring to you? No, painting is not done to decorate apartments. It is an instrument of war for attack and defense against the enemy. We believe that the same standards of journalism which apply to other areas can apply to the visual arts. A concern for covering the whole and not just an aspect and a respect for the truth. The vision of an artist as a whole man, not as a myth or a performing monkey. As I look back, the editorial covers all the bases. In spite of an ugly history, there is no righteous cry for justice. The tone is positive and practical and community-based. Jane Addams' ghost was hovering in the background. Thomas Dewey and Henry James, but nobody saw them. They were a family secret. We struggled for years. We built a community in the office and we developed a new network of writers. We had a board. But eventually the board got bored with us because we could no longer provide synthetic excitement for those people who wanted to ride in on the art scene and have a jolly happy time. We did not also provide evangelicism of a superficial nature. We delighted in diverse opinion for the simple reason it was a learning experience. I had such a fortunate life. My wisdom comes from the fact that I was fortunate to have conversations with thousands of people. We learned to disagree. It became understood the new art of examiner was clarity and we did not print art jargon and it did not belong to anybody. Eventually, Jane and I moved to Washington, D.C. It was the only way to raise the profile of the New Art Examiner nationally, and we pioneered a new scene. The National Endowment of the Arts was an important part of patronage for the avant-garde of artists and artist spaces. We poked around the NEA, and we learned that the patronage system was a bit like congressional pork. We irritated the NEA staff and their favorite sons. We followed the money and got to understand who gave the grants to whom and how the art pork was dished around. President Reagan made his first move to restrict the National Endowment of the Arts when he was rebuffed at the beginning of the Cultural Wars. Finally, Senator Jesse Helms demonized Andrew Serrano and Robert Maplethorpe and finished the job, convinced Congress they were degenerate, and the National Endowment was forced to eliminate artists and artist organizations from receiving grants, and the museum stood by and watched if the museum community had supported the artists under attack, Helms would have backed off as, he would, as Helms would not have taken on the social might of the museums. The new art examiner was in the thick of the fight. It was a lost cause. The museums backed off. One of the great joys we had of editing was meeting so many minds. A reoccurring problem was that so many writers were under the idea that if they used complicated language, they would sound more impressive. The deeply ingrained fear of using simple or uncomplicated language is very much present. Good criticism comes from the critic being able to recognize his or her own response to art. And that response is more important and that is the first impression and to reveal the first impression is a matter of courage. I truly learned the lesson that more originality was destroyed by people not having the confidence to take their own feelings, give them value and pursue them. Whether that be artists or critics is irrelevant. Strange as it may seem, when writers were enthusiastic to write, it usually meant a poor review. 
and the enthusiasm carries the writer along with a sense of enchantment that does not always lead to careful analysis. On the other hand, if the natural taste of the writer is challenged and is not reciprocated by the particular artist, and the immediate wonderful feelings flood the encounter and a thoughtful review will appear. We made it officially clear time and time again that we did not care what people said. We did not care what the response of the writer was. It was not a matter of approval. It was only a matter of the writer being vulnerable to take his responsibility for his own feelings. And when that happens, it was good writing. Well, I've just talked upon issues of power that underpin the art world in various ways. And the art world is controlled and managers, yet it tries to present an image of a free winning artist and academic disinterestedness. Critics and curators are social workers and nobody seems interested in anything but the one thing you can, can be sure you commit if you want to go into the art world is talk about money. Nobody talks about the money. Dante's excellent book, The End of Art, as many other similar books are usually written by academics who discount anything but critical theory. Baudelaire, writing in the middle of the 19th century, is allowed a freedom of language that is not possible today. The vitality of and decline of art is only a sideshow to the vitality and the decline of our society. The American dream of the post-war years has faded and the art has been co-opted is now a little faded and becomes a reminder of the dreams not passed on. There are so many avenues of discussion that lead into the pessimism of the current art world. The usual suspects are rounded up, museums, greedy markets, Andy Warhol, critics, the entire zeitgeist has changed and as the world has changed. The tide of optimism the post-war years generated, part by the collapse of Europe from World War II, the tide rushes in and all boats are lifted. Now the tide is going out and some boats will be stranded. The one great unknown factor that faces us all is the environment. To what extent our world will change is impossible to see. The great theme of our time is simply the environment and the new thinking of how we as humans will exist and live in a world that is due for major revision. The culture of excess that supported the arts in recent years has not produced much dynamic art. The rules of capitalism will have to be rewritten for the natural world and the rules of capitalism will have to be written for the world of culture. And that means the reward system will also have to change and the nature of patronage will have to change. The fact that Manhattan is defined by the culture of Wall Street and Wall Street would not like climate change unless it can make money from it. Wall Street only likes art that it can make money from. It is abundantly clear that the flight of critics indicates that the restrictions that they see on the art world are too constricting. The madness of popular culture that is given over to stimulation at any cost. It is time to look into our yesterdays and understand that the frenzy that we live in today is a little deranged. Art, I now think, has to be about reflection and concern with what might have been lost and what might has to be regained. The madness of popular culture that has given over to stimulation has penetrated the world. Popular culture is difficult. There's no room for response. That is why popular culture is a subtle form of fascism. Join the party, have fun or get lost is a simple option. Listen to any interview with a new singer or a football player or any other two-minute personality and they're all the same. Jeff Poons' kitsch has, denies any dignity. King Kay's kitsch is not a matter of denying dignity, it just lost it on the way. Tom Nakashima 
who I think you will hear more of in the future, is an artist who has a profound understanding of art, says, and I quote, I always tell my students that if you don't have a philosophy of life, you can't be an artist. For philosophy of life should stem, even if you don't think about it, your philosophy of art. I mean, you can paint pictures and call yourself an artist, but there has to be something there. I believe that an artist should have fundamental beliefs in an ethical system an ascetic system and a system of living. Maybe that's why a lot of artists are screwed up, because they can't get those things together. They're doing that painting that has nothing to do with their beliefs. I can only add to those words, which are my concluding words, and finish with a poem. Art is about loneliness. Art in itself is a deep inner dialogue with self, pursuing feelings that we do not have a name for. I'm grateful to Dylan Thomas, a man of the people, who spoke of the voice of a God. In my craft and sullen art, exercised in the still night, when only the moon rages and lovers lie abed, with all their griefs in their arms, I labor by singing light, not for ambition or bread, but for the common wages of their most secret heart. Not for the prayed man, for the raging moon I write on these spendthrift pages, but for their lovers, their arms round the grief of the ages. Why pay no praise or wages nor heed my craft or sullen art. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to take questions while time is available, if there is any time. Hmm? Thank you. Yes. N A K A S H M A. Yes. No questions? Yes, yes, please. Um, it's hard to kind of formulate a question. There's so much information in your lecture, which is, I think, really exciting. Um, it seems like you presented some ideas that. First, it was unclear as to whether you agreed with some of the ideas that you presented. You would bring up Danto, and it sounded like you might have been frustrated with some of the things he said, and then you, you know, said something positive about him. And I, I get the sense that what you're trying to say is that there is some hope, even with your very dark assessment of what's happened. Um, and I'm just wondering if you can comment on how you Well, I don't like being old, <laughs> but, I'm, but I'm glad I'm not young. <laughs> there are a few perks to being old, and one of them is I'm not young. But anyway, uh, uh, th there's always going to be art, and there's always going to be little children who make marks. No matter what happens, that primary urge is going to be there. I can only suggest some stay thoughts. And I, I know my lecture cannot be definitive and it cannot arrive at a neat conclusion. On the other hand, I think questions are more important than answers, which makes me a bit different from the general run of things. I think the future of art is going to be in thinking about Marx 
And I think it was always like that in history. So what comes off the end of a hand with a simple instrument is the beginning and end of art. But, you know, art's gotten a mess before. And I'll share this comment with you. Being a European, we have a cultural memory of the Royal Academy or the Salon, which was art in the end of the 19th century, which is where modernism rebelled against. American history being short doesn't really have a salon or, essential, or an academy which was a centralized point of 19th century art. The Industrial Revolution produced new society and the salon was a response in its later years to the new society which was the emergence of the middle class or the bourgeoisie. And it was a time when art was totally integrated with the public. And one of the great myths of art history that have been passed on willy-nilly has been that the Impressionists and the people against the Academy were populist and the Academy was elite. The Academy was the virtual reality of its day because it controls the whole media. That's when artists had a job, just like television. And I think there has to be a rethink about the beginning of modernism. And I don't think that's been thought about properly. I don't think we have the imagination to understand the problems that the early guys had in modernism when resisting the authority of the academy. They've only taught us about the winners. Now, the academy was the loser. And if the modern museum is the loser, as I think it is, in terms of things, I think we have to revisit what happened at that time. And I made some suggestions about photography, and I think that photography and modern media have imprinted us as people. And I think it's very hard and very difficult. We don't know how we've been imprinted. We have been imprinted. And I think we have to understand the imprinting of the accumulated world of media on our imagination and our understanding and our sense of self. So I can only make that as a suggestion. You're not saying that we de-imprint ourselves or that we even can, are you? I'm saying we have to deal with it. It's not for me to program. I can program myself, I can program my own sensibility, I can share that as, as me, but the problem is the imprinting. And, and, and I think that is our problem. I also think we have a problem that we tend, we have, I think we have a, a, another problem which is like democracy and education for everybody and art. And I think this is a liberal problem which on the one hand is that you want to embrace people and you want to bring them into a situation, but sometimes you pay a price that you shouldn't pay in order to do that. And that doesn't always justify the action. So I can, and I think we have to get a political awareness of cultural manipulation as it relates to political manipulation. The art business is no different than the political business. The art distribution system is no different than the political distribution system. So if you have ideas about the political distribution, just move them over to the art system. It doesn't walk alone, and it never has. One quick other thing, unless nobody else has a question. Nobody else has their hand up. They're too intimidated. <laughs> Yeah, but I find your words to be easy to understand. Your ideas complicate, complex, but your words easy. A lot of art speak, not all of it, but a lot of 
stuff out there is really dense, hard to dissect, and it seems like that's part of this weird convoluted, and I, I don't know, maybe, I'm, maybe that's what politics is. It seems to me that with politics, people are just so eager to say, left or right, you know? People who pay big salaries are not hired to tell the truth. People who get paid large salaries are not hired to speak the truth. Now, I'm an old guy, and I'm sort of in my last legs, and I'm not dangerous. So, so, so it's okay. You know, we can have fun. Uh, but the art world, and I, I'm. I'm the art world conspicuously ignored us, they conspicuously put us out in the cold. We were conspicuously demonized by liberals and conservatives. And we love art and we've done nothing wrong. We only wanted discussion. We refused to censor people. That's the fact. You make of it what you like. I'm just reporting a story. I think it's very sad that Gucci bags are going to be a desirable item in China. <laughs> and I think it's just an extension of the leveling of status symbols of a banal nature. And, you know, who are the interesting guys in the world? Tribals, not bourgeoisie in Shanghai, because they're like the bourgeoisie anywhere else. It's only, inter it's only intellectuals that are going to provide interesting things and original artists that are going to provide interesting things. And the money guys and the managers, like Saatchi, understand the image business, and that's media. And the interesting thing is only going to be by those who resist. And that's called Van Gogh, Gauguin, and Cezanne, and any other people we might like to put in there. But, you know, the art world's like Enron. And Enron are into globalization. <laughs> I, th I think the worst thing we did is threaten their ego. Unfortunately, people who collect art get so much power that they think they're artists. <laughs> and, and so it's their ego that overwhelms what they do, as well as money. And, so, no, because their egos are saturated by an army of mandarins, and they're called curators and museum directors. And they hire these guys, and these guys do all the critical theory, and the museums distribute it. So, it's just like, just the like... Becomes the product. No, the artist, no, he, he's out there in the fields and they may call him in. Because there's always more artists. Artists like oil. You tap the ground and more comes out, each generation. There's always new freshmen. There's always new freshmen. Now, when you've got freshmen, you're going to have art departments. <laughs> What, yeah, this one up here.
but you seem to have a, a much more pessimistic outlook about the way things are now. And yet, at all those other times, things got better, don't you think? And so, are you pessimistic, or do you think you know, we can move out of this circular singularity of history, of historical forces, and that there is an outlook? I hate to be a futurologist. And what I like about art is you look at it and you can see it and you deal with what's there. And I don't think we can talk about the future very much until we've learned to deal with what we have now. And culturally, I don't think there's a future until we get to terms with what we are doing now. And I get a bit worried about the people who get optimistic about the future because it's usually a way of evading what the mess is we're in now. I think we have to sort out where we are, and I think the sorting out of now will be the foot will be the road into the future. Well, then you think of sorting out. For me, the sorting out of the Italian Renaissance is the manners. I'm sorry? The sorting out of the Italian Renaissance? And sorting out of the salon system was the early impressionists, Van Gogh, Cezanne, and others. Is postmodernism the sorting out of modern modernity? <laughs> I don't think, for me, right? We talk about modernism <laughs> or modern. I don't. I think that when modern modernism came to America from Europe after World War II, I think it changed its nature, which is quite natural. It became Americanized, because Europe has a different cultural tradition than America. And it shared very much. So I think we have to start now and go back, if you like, to modern, because this was the American period. I don't think the issues are settled. I think they're up for grabs. There, you know, a lot of revisionism. And postmodernism, you know, whatever postmodernism is, it went, you know, it's chapter two of modern in America. That's only 40 years. So I don't think we, I don't, uh, you know, I still think has a long way to go before we deal with it. But what I am really interested in, which is what I suggested, the phenomena that all the critics, every single one, have said it's all over in New York. Now, New York's still the market, but I do not, und I think the phenomena of total agreement with the idea of cultural imploding, which all the critics have, I think that is so significant that I think it has to be looked at every day because it's like the ground has moved. And I think that's more than enough to deal with right now because I think the implications of it, I can't, I can't even imagine the implications of it. But it's very important. I don't think... And the fact that Ross Krauss throws her hand in at the end of her book, you know, with the final discussion, who is responsible for postmodernism in a certain kind of way, the fact that she does to me is a, a gesture of throwing her cards on the table uh, uh, is an important thing. But nobody's dealing with it. Everybody's circling around it. it, it it's politically correct, but they're not dealing with it.
there is really good work being made, and people are starting to recognize what that means after like bad painting sort of died in the 80s, if that makes any sense. With all due respect to you, every generation thinks it's doing significant work. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a constant. Yeah. Which there, was a, there was just a hierarchy of, uh, you know, some great photography. But, 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 but talking, about art school, talking about art schools, I don't think art schools teach kids to read the magazines. I don't think it teaches them to understand what's going on. And I don't think new versions of critical discourse that are taught is the answer. Because the animal of the art world, whatever that animal is, or it's a weird hybrid, I don't think that hybrid is taught. And I think when that is taught, then it'd be easier to understand what comes out from that animal. I think they're only picking up the messages after they've been delivered. I think they've got to start thinking about how the messages are generated. Doesn't matter what the messages are, it's the dynamic of how they're generated. Last question. No last question? Thank you very much.